The journey of quality speaks of the paradigm of a processed approach of good inputs in delivering the desired clinical outcome. An infant fighting for survival from infection and gastrointestinal diseases. A patient conquering over severe respiratory disease. Over 45 years, JBCPL delivering quality care. JB Chemicals and Pharmaceuticals Limited. Passion with a purpose. India has the highest burden of disease in the world. The Poseidon. In this study, 1,400 healthcare practitioners participated. More than 2 lakhs patients were screened, which have found more than 5 lakh reasons for visiting the doctor. The study revealed the fact that a larger number of patients visit primary healthcare practitioners majorly for respiratory and digestive system symptoms. Poseidon also showed that across age groups, respiratory and digestive system symptoms were impacting the quality of life in patients, out of which more than 50% were presented with respiratory symptoms and more than 25% were presented with symptoms related to digestive system across age groups from pediatric to geriatric. In addressing the unmet needs and highly prevalent medical challenges, JBCPL is launching a new team, introducing JBCPL Nova. JBCPL, we manufacture India's well-known brands Rantac, Ranitidin, Metrogil, Metronidazole, Silica, Silinidipin, and Nicardia, Nifedipin, to improve respective treatment outcomes. Team Nova will address two key pathology. Allergic March, the highly prevalent respiratory disease manifestation across age groups, and GERD, gastrointestinal disease that impacts quality of life from pediatric to geriatric. JBCPL Nova bringing array of portfolio and offerings to fight the progression of allergic march and GER. Our child care offerings Rantac, Ranitidin syrup, Laxolite, Polyethylene glycol syrup, Cutpro, Bacillus subtilis syrup, Zikaf Herbal Cough Syrup Our Chest Care Offerings Nilhis Blastin Tablet and Syrup Nilhis M Blastin with Montelukast Tablet Viscojoy Anastylcysteine Effervescent Tablet Viscojoy AB Anastylcysteine and Acibrophylline Capsule No Smoke Nicotine Lozenges Altavir Oseltamivir capsule, Favipil, Favipiravir tablet. Nova takes pleasure to meet medical fraternity across India to become the preferred scientific partner with four key imperatives. Support early diagnosis, establishing guideline practice for targeted disease category, driving treatment adherence, and to offer treatment choices. Nova has created various customized scientific platforms to meet the medical fraternity and take expert opinion. On-site connect, ether symposium, sharing experience, education, knowledge, seek, aspire, CME, scientific investment plan, SIP, digital real world connect, DRC. Team Nova 
is a proud arm of JB Chemicals and Pharmaceuticals Limited, delivering quality care over 45 years. Passion with a purpose. Yes, uh, so thank you so much, uh, everyone, for uh, watching our uh, video. Uh, I do understand the time really is very, very critical and very, very crucial as of now. And uh, so amidst this critical time of COVID, uh, there's an altogether a paradigm shift in our current practice. Uh, so to discuss more about it, today we have with us one very eminent and most experienced speaker for today's session. Uh, would like to invite Dr. S. Yuvarajan, sir, and just would like to briefly introduce uh, sir. Uh, sir has done his MDBS, uh, MD in pulmonary medicine. Sir has done his DND in respiratory diseases and also got fellowship in College of Chest Physician from USA. He's also got his European Diploma in Adult Respiratory Medicine from Germany and currently he's a professor and HOD of Respiratory Medicine of uh, Sri Manakula Vinayagar Medical College and Hospital, which is one of the best college and research institute in Pondicherry. He's a regular invited faculty at a European Respiratory Society Congress, most prestigious international conference in the field of respiratory medicine, which happens every year in European countries. He's a selected as a future leader in the international workshop on lung health, health that was being held in Prague in Jan 2020. Is awarded as an outstanding pulmonologist of the decade in the National Conference of Pulmonary Need, which is held in Nag, which was held in Nagpur 2020 from Honorable Health Secretary the, from Government of Maharashtra. Sir has been an invited faculty speaker, chairperson at various scientific platforms for both national as well as international conference, and he has also got innumerable publications in his name. At present, Sir is Joint Secretary for Association of Pulmonologists in Puducherry. His area of interest includes interventional pulmonology, both bronchoscopy and thoracoscopy, sleep disorders, ILD, connective tissue disorders affecting the lung and airway disorders. I welcome you, sir, for this web-based event. And now, without much wasting time, would like to hand over the session to Dr. Yuvarajan, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Jay. Uh, thanks, uh, JB Chemicals, for uh, organizing this event, first event, which is one of the uh, uh, most uh, needed event uh, that uh, we are going to discuss uh, today afternoon. Uh, is my voice is clear? Yes, sir. Clear. Yes, sir. Uh, it's clear. Okay. Okay. Can you see my screen uh, slides? Yes, sir. Okay, uh, first of all, good afternoon, uh, one and all, for uh, organize, for uh, organizing here to have a discussion on COVID-19 landscape. So, for another half an hour to 45 minutes, I'm going to discuss with you uh, what are the uh, various uh, uh, scenarios that what we faced in the past uh, two years on this COVID-19 pandemic. There are lots of research papers, there are a lot of treatments, ongoing treatments, and uh, there are a lot of treatments which is not proven it uh, to be so much efficacious in COVID-19. There are a lot of diagnostic flaws, a lot of mutant strains, all these things we are going to have a overview in, in another uh, 30 to 40 minutes, 45 minutes. So what we are going to discuss today is uh, the clinical observations uh, for the past one after two years and how to go about the diagnosis of COVID-19 and how to manage a patient with COVID-19. So as we all know, COVID-19 is not a new disease. Now it's an acute uh, respiratory disease that is caused by novel coronavirus, initially termed as 2019-NCOV, later termed as SARS-CoV-2. Initially, we are not knowing the exact genomic sequencing, but uh, after two, three months of uh, you know, this illness, uh, we got a complete uh, or full genome sequencing and phylogenetic analysis that showed us that this, this is not a new virus, it's a, actually a coronavirus, which is there for many years. Uh, you know, uh, it belongs to the same family and uh, it belongs to beta coronavirus family. So this is the structure of this coronavirus. You could see uh, why it is termed as corona. This corona is nothing but spiking like a sun. You could see the central core with surrounding spikes. These spikes are nothing but spike proteins. 
these are highly antigenic and these are responsible for the attachment of this virus to the host cells and you could see when you see the cut section of the virus you could see this uh, on the surface the spiking surface with a narrow uh, a base and broad um, apex you could see this is these are the spikes glycoprotein and these are the highly antigenic epitopes in the uh, in the uh, covid virus and you could see next to the spike protein, what you are seeing is an, uh, you could see the M protein, what is there in the uh, green one. That's nothing but a membrane protein. And they are hemoglobin stress dimer and, and uh, one more protein called an envelope protein. That is the uh, one in yellow. And inside you could see the RNA. So basically, you know, there are three main pathogenic, uh, you know, uh, um, structures that are there in the uh, um, coronavirus. You could see the surface. Uh, spiking spike glycoprotein, which is responsible for the attachment for the uh, virus to the host cells. And second thing is the membrane protein. And third thing is the envelope protein. All these are highly antigenic. So exterior envelope with distinctive spike glycoprotein S uh, and the viral caps, virus capsid that is protecting the nucleic acid inside and M and E proteins. are All these things are responsible for the pathogens of COVID-19. So what is the problem uh, with uh, this uh, COVID-19 uh, and the SARS-CoV-2? There are around 11 types of mutations have been detected. We don't know how far it is clinically significant, but, but, but it is largely worrisome that mutations are there. And A to A mutation is very dominant and it could be as high as 80%. In, in India, around 40 to 50% of the mutation have been detected. This A to A mutation is dominant. What is this actually? This is nothing but the mutation the surface that is a spike protein, what I showed in the last slide. This spike protein is responsible for attachment. So what happened is because of that mutation, the, it alters the receptor binding uh, of the virus to the AS2 receptors. So AS2 receptors, that is angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptors, are widely accepted in various literature or widely accepted in various countries that these are the initial binding site for the virus to get entry in the host cell. So because of the alteration of this spike protein in the surface, so what it can lead to, either this mutation can lead to increased virulence or decreased virulence, but unfortunately, it is, uh, you know, we are in a fear that it can increase the virulence. Basically, this alteration of the, uh, the spike protein and alteration of the receptor binding of the virus to the AS2 receptor, that leads to the increase in the binding capacity increase in the penetration capacity, increase in the virulence of the strain and increase in disease severity. So you, you, you could easily see the difference, you know, that the first wave and second wave difference, what we faced in India right now. So in the first wave, most of the patients were sent to the home for home isolation. Most of the patients are asymptomatic or with mild symptoms. Very less patients got into the severe disease or moderate disease. They come to the hospital with the less requirement of oxygen. But what we face now is that there are two things what we are seeing as a major difference. One is that there are a lot of lots of lots of cases have been reported because of the massive spread. You know the the you know the the, the rate of spread is very high when compared to the uh, um, the first wave. And second thing is that the virulence of the strain. You know that in the same family you could see the chunks and chunks of cases. And third thing is that you could see the lot of patients who require the oxygen for their you know survival and a lot of patients have significant lung involvement in the second wave that leads to you know that you know that uh, that leads that leads to thinking that definitely some mutant is there and you could see the change in the pattern of disease in the second wave and uh, you know uh, in the first wave most of the patients are, are sent home the second wave the more some patients who are in home isolation also getting sick and there is there was a saying in the last uh, wave that uh, only those patients who are at risk factors, maybe age more than 60 years, known patients with a known cardiac disease, known ischemic heart disease, the patient with a known chronic respiratory disease, known chronic kidney disease, all these patients high risk of developing progressive lung disease. But this is not so. In fact, it is there, but it is not so in this way because we are getting cases even without risk factors, we are getting a, a severe form of disease, even those patients who are less than 30 years. So that needs a, a more amount of research in this area. And you could see uh, the SARS-CoV-2, it is very similar to the previous epidemics, like, you know, that uh, the SARS epidemic and MERS epidemic, which belongs to the same family of virus. What's the exact difference? You know, the, the difference is uh, simple. You could see that most of the animal reservoir, most of the patient, mo most of these virus have bats as animal reservoirs. And intermediate host in case of uh, COVID-19, the SARS-CoV-2, pangolins are considered as intermediate host. Now we don't have a clear-cut data whether uh, it is exact intermediate host, but definitely many people accepted this uh, statement as pangolin as intermediate host. And whereas in SARS-CoV-2, it is palm severs as intermediate host. And mass cov that is middle aged respiratory syndrome, camels are considered as intermediate host. And regarding the host receptor, where this virus gets attached, 
so most uh, you know most case of sars cov2 you know ace2 is considered the receptor that is responsible for the attachment to the host cell and in case of sars cov2 once again ace2 whereas in mers cov2 it is dpp4 and when you see the case fatality rate when you see the case fatal rate even though the infectious rate is very high with the sars cov2 the fatality rate when compared to the previous epidemics what we faced uh, before that is the sars epidemic and mers epidemic you could see the difference like whereas in mers epidemic even though number of cases are very less you could see that mortality rate is very high almost 34.4% of uh, people died due to mers cov2 uh, mers cov and sars uh, in sars around 9.5% and in sars cov2 is around 2.3% but even this 2.3% uh, uh, means a lot for us because it involves a large group of population. It, uh, you know, at most it is a pandemic. So this 2.3 percent also will cause a significant number of deaths in the world. And when you see the reproductive number, what is the reproductive number? It is another another measure that uh, you you should uh, uh, you should note in all the case of epidemic and pandemic. It is nothing but uh, you know number of cases that are being infected that are being converted into a disease with the help of single case. So that is considered as a uh, reproductive number. You could see the reproductive number of SARS-CoV-2 it is two to two point five, whereas it's SARS-CoV it is one point seven to one point nine. In MERS it is point seven. You could see uh, the infectious nature is very well high with SARS-CoV-2 and compared to SARS and MERS. But you know there are there are other infectious diseases where the you know the reproductive number is very high. For example, if you take that matter, uh, smallpox, uh, chickenpox. Mums, measles, rubella, all these things, you know, the reproductive number is documented one is roughly around four to six. And even in fact, even seven to eight also. So basically, this reproductive number is somewhat less, but you know, the uh, the involvement is huge in the whole population. That's why it created a very uh, nasty environment in the world. So, uh, you know, how is this, how this disease is transmitted? Basically, this uh, COVID-19 is a respiratory disease, even though we tell that almost all the organs are involved at one point of time, but you know, the respiratory system is predominantly involved, either it's upper respiratory tract or lower respiratory tract. So the, the mode of spread is primarily through respiratory droplets. How it gets spreads? Any patient with the suspected or probable or any patient with the confirmed COVID-19 uh, pneumonia or a confirmed COVID-19 URTA. So when the patient coughs, when the patient sneezes, when the patient inhales or expires, so he breathes out, just, he just releases a lot of respiratory droplets. The respiratory droplets, which are more than five microns in diameter, and the respiratory droplets, uh, uh, th these droplets are larger, and these droplets cannot travel for the longer distance. It gets settled out, so it travels less than one meter. That's why uh, we have a concept that you should always leave a six feet uh, difference. Social distance is very important because the mode of spread is the close contact within six feet. If you sit or if you talk or if you discuss with the patient, when the patient coughs, sneezes, or speaks or sings, so these droplets, you know, carrying the virus is one of the source of infection for this COVID-19. But of course, there is a concept in the initial uh, wave that whether it's an airborne disease, you know, airborne is nothing but, you know, if you are sitting in one place, if the droplet size is very small, less than five microns carrying the virus, it would travel for more than one meter. That's called airborne. So what we are uh, seeing most of the um, cases uh, with uh, COVID-19 is mostly a close contact spread. Whereas airborne is accepted one, but it is not widely accepted because we are not uh, very sure that it is completely airborne. Because if it have been airborne, it will be a you know it will be a disaster. And there are some concepts that it is maybe airborne disease because uh, there are reports that uh, those people who are uh, uh, occupying the uh, rooms, who are occupying the areas where these infected patients are there, so these patients gets infected even though when they are uh, placed at the uh, uh, when they are when they are keeping a social distancing. So. Airborne spread is also possible in patients with COVID-19. And third, uh, less common route is contact through the in contaminated surface. But this is not so common uh, mode when compared to other uh, things that what I have discussed uh, uh, with you just a few minutes before. And entering the human body through the mouth, nose, and eyes. So basic mode of spread is through the respiratory droplets by close contact. So after, you know, after getting exposed to the infective material, so when you get the disease that is called incubation period it may vary or it may it may be known between 1 to 14 days highly variable you can develop symptom on the next day or you can develop symptom after two weeks also so roughly for most of the cases around five within 5.1 days you will develop form of some form of mild symptoms or any symptoms of related to covid 19 
97.5 percent of those who develop symptoms doing so within 11.5 days of infection. So median day, almost like within 5.1 day, most of the patients will develop uh, symptoms, and almost 97 percent will develop symptoms within 11.5 days. So when you compare the incubation period with the pre previous uh, um, epidemic history, so when you compare this with the SARS uh, epidemic and MERS epidemic, uh, SARS CoV2 has a longer incubation period. You can see that it can uh, it can vary from the next day to up to two weeks. Whereas SARS COV and MERS COV are roughly around five days, maybe two to seven days for SARS and the MERS around five days. So MERS, it can extend up to 14 days also as per the some uh, studies. So what is the current data? As of 11th May 2021, you could see that almost like more than 159 million cases were reported in, uh, in many countries and five countries with the highest uh, cumulative number of cases that basically in states, uh, India, Brazil, France and Turkey, these are the five countries where the, there's a huge load of cases there and almost like more than 3.3 million deaths, even though the fatality rate is comparatively less when compared to the previous epidemic, what we faced in the world. But, you know, the involvement uh, uh, globally is high. That's why, uh, you know, even 2.8%, 2.5% is a matter. So more than 3.3 million deaths were there, were reported. And out of uh, all the countries, once again, the five major countries like uh, states, Brazil, India, UK and Italy reported large number of deaths among this COVID pandemic. You could see the tally of this uh, cases that cases are gradually, uh, you know, picking up. So initial waves, more than a first wave, uh, we got a worse seat from the second wave started early uh, in this uh, year. So what about second wave? Uh, the second highest number of people infected with the coronavirus um, uh, is uh, in India in the second wave. As of April 20, 2021, uh, it ranks number one in the world in the average daily case that is detected, which is follow, uh, followed by US and Brazil, ranks third in the average daily deaths, and one out of every six new cases in the world originates from India. So during the second wave, there are two uh, states which have worsted, that is Maharashtra and Punjab worsted. Now uh, we are getting uh, cases all over India. And just a simple statistic which was published in Times of India uh, regarding the second wave. Uh, the green one uh, uh, belongs to India and the red one belongs to uh, US. You could see uh, the second wave that started in July. Uh, there's a picture of July in US. After that, gradually October, there's a dip was there. After that, in January, in, in, in late December and January, you could have a huge peak of the number of cases of uh, COVID-19. After that, there is a dip was there. In April, there is a huge dip was there. But in that dip, from that, you know, when you see the curve in India, from April last year, it was started. Gradually, there is a rise of cases. In October, there was a case. Uh, there was a there is a peak on, picking of case near the October and then gradual decline and in January and February there was a complete decline of cases and then once again April there is a second wave started and it is causing a huge disaster and when you compare the death also the same scenario when you see the uh, 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 data of uh, uh, United States you could see from the March you could see uh, there is a uh, there is a lot of patients died um, almost like um, 3,000 2,000 3,000 people have died initially uh, from March to May. And after that, there's a dip in the death rate around July. And once again, once again, early, early, that's late of uh, 2020, that's November, December, and early January, you could see the fluctuations and then some peaking of the death rate in US. And now in India, you could see the death rate is comparatively less last year when compared to US. We, we could have seen in newspapers come by seeing Italy and uh, US, a lot of uh, deaths and the people are you know, struggling to get oxygen beds and people are uh, treating all the patients, all the patients with severe ERDs in the roads and streets. But now the same scenario is going to, uh, is happening in India. You could see the number of deaths also increase and now it's peaking out. So what's the problem that already dis uh, already described with you that coronavirus is constantly mutating. So for 736 UK, 34 South African strains and one Brazil variant identified worldwide, a new double mutant strain of SARS-CoV-2 virus also discovered. There are three types of modifications which are being uh, closely monitored during this, during this pandemic. So that improve the virus ability to spread faster. That cause more, more serious disease in the infected individual that help virus evade the immune response. These are the three problems that we, uh, you know, we are much worried about the mutant strains. Uh, you know, uh, even though a lot of mutant strains have been reported in the case uh, uh, studies and reports and case series and all. So none of the UK and South African Brazilian strains led to the current rise in India, what we are seeing now. 
So uh, you could see what are the complications. You know, as I already described, it's a primarily respiratory disease, but it's not restricted only to the respiratory system. Any system is involved. It can involve the heart in the form of myocarditis or sudden arrhythmia or sudden cardiac death, increased risk of thrombotic events like ischemic heart disease and acute uh, coronary syndrome. And uh, in case of um, uh, in case of uh, kidneys, it can cause acute kidney injury and renal shutdown in case of, uh, you know, um, the neurological system also involved, like in case of meningitis and asymptomatic, all these things are involved. So, you know, it is not a single system that is uh, to be, uh, you know, you should concentrate in case of, uh, you know, uh, advanced and severe disease, you always concentrate on multiple systems. And what are the warning signs that you should see, you should explain to the patient. Any patient with a persistent high-grade fever, or any patient with a dyspnea with SP out of less than 95, to, to be precise, less than 94, any person with sudden onset of chest pain and dizziness on standing. So complication aspect in any organs. And one of the drastic or very bad complication, what we see in day-to-day -day practice, particularly it is very high in India. Uh, we don't know, it may, be a, uh, it may be a difference in the method of practice uh, using, um, uh, you know, contaminated humidifiers, using uh, uh, irrational use of steroids and prolonged or, uh, you know, um, self-medications. All these things can lead to the increase of invasive fungal pneumonia, particularly mucormycosis is on rise in India. But this is termed as COVID-associated mucormycosis, which can call it as a CAM. We don't know whether this, all this uh, contaminated humidifiers, steroids, and the host response is as well, mucormycosis or anything uh, beyond that. Uh, we need to study that. Uh, whether this COVID has, uh, you know, complex relationship with the mucor, all these things uh, yet to be answered in future. Uh, and you could, when you see the timeline, you could see the timeline, as I already told, uh, incubation period uh, varies from one days to 14 days, one day to 14 days. So basically, uh, you know, in day one also you can um, test for, uh, you know, uh, your RT-PCR, but you know, the, the early period when you test it, what will happen? Because of low arrhythmia, there is a high chance of false negative report. So basically on day two or day three, um, you know, the, the positive report, uh, you know, the chance of getting RTPC positive is very high and uh, it can extend up to, you know, most of the times, you know, like seven to 10 days is the time we will tell. And mostly after 14 days, you will have, uh, you, you will see the uh, change of positive to negative report. And but this is not true for all the patients because those patients with severe disease, those patients with significant involvement, lung involvement, and those patients who are uh, on mechanical ventilator, you can see this uh, shedding of virus even up to one and a half months. So these are the high risk population we need to take care, uh, uh, especially those patients who are elderly and males, particularly those patients who are pregnant and uh, people with underlying chronic disease, like patients with hypertension, patients with coronary artery disease or any chronic heart diseases or patients with uncontrolled or poorly controlled diabetes mellitus. Very, very important. This diabetes and COVID is actually having a complex relationship. Uh, those patients who are pre-diabetic, I could see some patients are turned to be diabetic after COVID. That may be partly because of drug, that may be partly because of illness due to stress or uh, due to the illness itself. Mm, the patients are, uh, you know, having a, a, a turned out to be a diabetic patients and any patient with a chronic respiratory disease may be that better. So it may be a COPD, it may be asthma, it may be a uh, old ILD or it may be a uh, bronchitis, anything. These patients are at high risk of developing progressive lung disease. So high risk of mortality is seen in uh, um, special group of patients, the development of condition increase the risk of critical uh, critical scenario and mortality, uh, basically because of the cytopathic effect of virus and cytokine storm, sustained inflammatory response and prolonged hypoxemia and septic shock. All these uh, things can lead to the morbidity and mortality in patients with COVID-19 pneumonia. So what are the typical symptoms you will see when you see a patient with COVID-19? So usually most of the patients present with fever, some patients present the dry cough. See, actually, dry cough is another important sign that you should note. So you could see, you could differentiate, you should differentiate whether this cough is because of upper respiratory tract involvement or lower respiratory tract because the cough in lower respiratory tract involvement is an early sign that lung is badly involved that you should, you know, escalate your therapy. Uh, but some patients have, uh, you know, uh, running nose and post-nasal drip and all. So these patients will have a dry cough even from day one also. So when you do an examination, you should always note uh, these points very carefully. So fever, dry cough, dyspnea, definitely it's not an early sign. It will be a, somewhere around five to eight days, usually present with dyspnea, uh, not in the day one, and sore throat. Even though sore throat is not a typical sign of COVID-19 because isolated sore throat cannot be a presentation for COVID-19 because sore throat is very commonly seen in flu, not in, uh, uh, in COVID-19. But it has been reported 
uh, is as one of the symptom of COVID-19 when it presents the other, other, other symptoms. So other common symptoms, what I, according to my personal experience, common symptoms are fever, fever, fever. And after that, the patient usually presents with the myalgia. The myalgia is very typical. The patient will complains of like, you know, like uh, uh, backache and, you know, neck pain, not able to lift the arms, all these things usually reported by the patients and headache. Of course, even without fever, uh, before fever also, they will have a headache, frontal headache, very typical of um, uh, COVID-19 uh, illness. And fatigue, fatigue is one of the presentation. And, and of late, in the second wave, what we are seeing is around from day four to, from day, day three to day six, we are seeing patients with the loose tools. So one of the, one of the typical presentation of COVID-19 in the second wave and vomiting, rhino and dizziness also there. And of late, some patients also present with the conjunctivitis, Unilateral conjunctivitis is another presentation, presentation of COVID-19 in the second wave. And anosmia and dysgeusia is also uh, uh, part of um, uh, symptom profile in patients with COVID-19. So these are the difference. These are the data. Uh, this is the commonest uh, clinical presentation of COVID-19. As you see the data, when you compare the SARS and MERS, uh, almost 88.7% percent of the fever. Uh, next to fever, non-protective cough along 67 to 67.7%. Next to that, you see dyspnea, 45-6%, but I won't accept this data because uh, this dyspnea is very common in uh, uh, those patients got a moderate to severe disease and uh, this, this percentage uh, looks quite larger and uh, this is not... Uh, Mm, this data, I think we need to check. And uh, fatigue, almost like 29.4 percent. Sore throat, around 10 to 10 to 15 percent. Diarrhea, around 6.1 percent. Nausea, vomiting, around 5 percent. Dizziness, 3.7 percent. Headache, around 8 percent. So this dizziness may be a sign of hypoxemia. So those patients who are not uh, getting monitored by the healthcare system. Uh, so around the, from six to eight days, if they have dizziness, they have a weakness, extreme weakness, definitely uh, you need to check the, uh, you know, their oxygen level. Hypoxia is another th thing that you will have uh, lightedness and dizziness. The patient could not sleep properly. And in addition to that, they will have a cough and dyspnea. So this is very important. Tracking of symptoms is very important. And history taking also plays a major role in preventing the morbidity and mortality in patients with COVID-19. From day one to day three, on the uh, day three of the onset of symptoms, how the how it usually starts. Fever generally appears on the first day. Upper respiratory symptoms like uh, cough, sore throat, and running nose may appear by uh, day two or day three. So first three days, you will have a fever, you will have a headache, you will have a running nose, you will have a sore throat. So most of the patients will have a mild symptoms like this, almost 80%. So from day four to day nine, it can reach the lung. It reaches the lung between day three to day four. So to be precise, uh, you know, from day five is all the problem uh, 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 arises. So day five, you should be very very careful. And labored breathing may start by from day four to day nine. Fourteen percent can experience experience these severe symptoms. From day eight to day fifteen, if it is not un, if it is not noticed properly, if it is not taken care of properly, it can lead to uh, ARDS and the patient can, can succumb. And sepsis may develop at the end of first week. So basically, what I used to tell is that most of the patients when they come to me, so at nearing around one week, around roughly around six to eight days, I used to uh, I used to check whether the lung got involved or not. So basically, I do I ask for a CT. The patient have uh, more hacking cough. The patient have dyspnea, or the patient have deep in saturation. Definitely, I ask for a further workup to prevent a damage in the lung. So that can lead to the uh, you know that can lead to morbidity and mortality in these patients and. Uh, uh, by identifying these patients uh, early, so we can prevent, uh, you know, uh, disasters. Yeah. So there are uh, uh, important uh, lab findings. What you have to uh, note in the patient COVID-19. Okay. Most of the patients we ask for a uh, CBC. In the CBC, what you see in case of viral any viral pneumonia, what you notice is leukopenia and lymphopenia. The lymphocytes are one of the important marker for any viral infections. You see, in uh, COVID-19, what you used to see initially in the first wave is that NL ratio, that is neutrophil lymphocyte ratio. Uh, you know, the lymphocyte should be more than a, a normal cutoff, almost like more than 8 to 20 percent. So, if the lymphocyte is in the lower side, the, so maybe in uh, every third day, if you are doing lymphocytes are continuously on the lower side. So, you, sh you should be worried because, you know, like uh, this uh, indirectly gives you a clue that uh, you are facing a severe disease and there is high chance that the patient have a, um, a progressive disease. So, that has to be noted. And if possible, you can ask for an NL ratio. And NL ratio somewhat correlates with the disease activity, somewhat correlates, not in all the patients. 
and you can see the thrombocytopenia as you see in other viral illness you can see the transient thrombocytopenia in 12 percent of patients and also you could you could see elevated ast alt in 28 to 35 percent of patients so uh, so when you see the uh, chest x-ray or radiology uh, unilateral infiltrate is seen in around 10 percent bilateral infiltrate around 84 to 90 percent no findings in 14 percent so this depends upon the uh, uh, duration of illness and uh, when you are taking an x-ray or ct uh, actually you know x-ray is not a very sensitive in investigation that you should ask for a uh, COVID-19 because, you know, X-ray uh, can miss uh, ground early ground glass opacity, can miss the peripheral shadows because it can overlap with the soft tissue shadows. So that's why X-ray is somewhat, somewhat inferior when compared to the CT chest. But you can ask one question, sir, can we do CT chest in all the patients? No, no, no. CT chest is not a, uh, is not an initial diagnostic modality for all the patients with COVID-19 uh, for a lot of reasons. One is radiation assault, unnecessarily should not do a CT for the patients with mild illness or th those patients who don't, who are not having any signs of lung involvement. So any patient who are having a persistent cough after five days, any patient who are having persistent fever, or any patient, if you think that the patient will, will progress to a severe disease, definitely you should ask for a CT roughly around six to seven days of illness. If the day one illness, the patient was very sure, you can just do on six or seventh day to assess, to exactly predict how far the disease will progress. So what are the complications? So... The dreadful complication, ERDS, uh, is noticed in 18 to 30% uh, of cases in from various case reports and case studies. Acute kidney injury is seen in 5% of cases. Septic shock, only in few patients, less than 5% actually. Metabolic acid is very hard to correct when you go for, when you see a patient with sepsis. Coagulopathy is seen in 16 to 49%. Multi-organ failure is, that is one of the leading cause of death uh, in ICUs. So that you should note and death ultimately in, in some patients. So what are the samples you can uh, prefer? You can take a nasal swab, you can take a nasopharyngeal swab. So basically the samples can be divided into uh, upper respiratory, uh, respiratory samples and lower respiratory samples. Usually what we are depending on mainly upper respiratory samples, basically nasopharynx is the area where the viral load is high. So you can just select a nasopharyngeal swab first and next to the nasopharyngeal you can ask for a nasal swab then throat swab. So sometimes you can ask for a hybrid swab. So actually nasopharyngeal swab is much, much better than nasal swabs. Uh, the sensitivity specificity is very high of getting a positive result in nasopharyngeal swab. Sometimes what happened, throat swab also come in. What we call it as hybrid swab. So we can combine this nasopharyngeal and oropharyngeal swab. It's one of the most preferred method of uh, collection of upper respiratory sample in case of uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, diagnosis. And use of bronchoscopy as a diagnostic method of COVID-19 is not recommended because it's a aerosol generating procedure. You should not uh, do a bronchoscopy unnecessarily in patients with COVID-19 uh, unless otherwise you are suspecting some other disease. Um, uh, uh, some other disease is um, is uh, you know suspe is suspected along with the COVID-19. The sensitivity of RT-PCR test seems to be very high. There may be false positive results due to swab contamination, but this is very rare. And single negative test does not rule out SARS-CoV-2 because you know, uh, you know this. This depends upon the period of testing. Sometimes what happens in early phase of viremia when the viral load is very low, as per the CT value, it will be reported as negative only. But we, if the patient is having a uh, such a clinical symptom which is almost correlating with the COVID-19, definitely we may ask them to repeat the test on the uh, another after two or three days. So it may be advisable to repeat the test or collect a deeper respiratory tract sample as advised in the various guidelines. So what is the role of uh, antibody test? Actually, this antibody test, you know, like uh, I feel that this is uh, this should not be a method of diagnosis for uh, COVID-19 pneumonia. And it is, you know, the sensitivity specificity varies, depends upon the kits, what we are using and depends upon the company uh, making the kits. And by, by, by measuring the antibodies, you could not come to a conclusion that what we are uh, seeing exactly, whether the patient is an acute phase, subacute phase, or whether it uh, is a chronic phase, that is, that, that is you know, he might have caught a previous disease. And moreover, it helps to identify the, those patients who have a previous COVID-19 infection, but uh, you know the individual results has to be interpreted with caution. The positive result may be, may be as likely to reflect a false positive as a true positive, as I described in the last slide. So, as I described uh, in the radiology section that, uh, you know, CT uh, is another important modality of diagnosis in those patients who got a lung disease. So, typical CT findings in patients with COVID-19. So, you know, depending upon the, you know, uh, timeline, you could see the findings. So, basically, the, the classical de description, what you see in COVID-19 is, uh, it's basically a peripheral and subplural lung involvement. You could see the lung, 
uh, you could see that all the most of the lesions are close to the chest wall, close to the periphery of the lung, just beneath the pleura. So this is very, very classical of COVID-19 pneumonia. And the type of lesion, early lesions will look like a ground glass. You could see the ground glass. Ground glass is nothing but, you know, the lesions are white. There is increased attenuated lesions. But just behind the lesion, like a mirror, you could see all the structures. You could see the vessel, you could see the lung parenchyma. That is called ground glass. So you could see the difference of attenuation here and here. This lesion is more dense when compared to this. Now you could see the lesions are classically distributed along the edges of lung. And here also, when you see the lesion here, these lesions are light. Then compared to these lesions, there is a slight increase in attenuation. Then when you see the, this lesion, this is more white than this. So basically, this is evolution of lesion. Now when you see when you take a CT in different timeline, maybe in early period and late period, you, do the, you, you get like this. You could see the lesion almost like a jet white and less ground glassing. This is less ground glassing and more of consolidation pattern. And here also you could see the more of ground glassing with some few air bogongram. And here you could see the mixer pattern. You could see the, uh, you know, early reticulations, early reticulations and ground uh, and consolidation. And you could see the ground glassing and the lesions are almost involving almost like, you know, in the left lung, it is almost 80% uh, of lung involved, the right lung almost 30% of lung involved. So basically, you could see, you could assess the involvement of lung uh, by seeing the CT. And here you could see here almost like there are some ground glass opacities, there are consolidation of the reticular opacities. You could see the interstitial thickening is also there in this uh, in this CT, but the involvement is uh, diffuse. So by seeing the CT, there are different patterns that you can describe. There are some patterns that you could see the vascular involvement. You could see the round lesions, different, different patterns are there. But the most common accepted one is that it's a peripheral, patchy, uh, subplural ground glassing and with varying uh, you know, intensity. So peripheral and lower lobes are commonly involved, bilateral, multiple lobular involvement, subsegmental areas of consolidation, especially in cases, advanced cases, those patients, severe pneumonia, you will have a dense consolidation in ICU patient. The number of segments involved is related to the disease severity. You can ask one question, sir, whether the CT report um, they are reporting as a severity score, whether it correlates well with the disease or not. Definitely, if you correlates, uh, if you correlate uh, well with the symptoms and uh, with the timeline of the uh, uh, disease, uh, it correlates well. But you know, some of the old patients, uh, those who got recovered, also they have a very poor CT score. That doesn't mean that the patient uh, will have a prolonged disease. But it depends upon the clinical scenario. So we should not always depend on the CT score while managing the patients. So non-typical CT findings include pleural effusion, only seen in 5% of cases, masses or cavitation. So when you see a mass or cavitation or nodule uh, in a COVID pandemic, so now we are seeing more of mucor. So you should think of mucor and invasive fungal pneumonias also, uh, because you know the CAM is a separate entity that's coming up right now. So you should think of um, COVID-associated mucor mycosis or COVID-associated invasive fungal pneumonias. And therefore, if you find these findings, you should think of alternative diagnosis. Other differential diagnosis you should consider, but you know, most of the times any patient with fever, with typical symptoms, first, first think of COVID before uh, ruling out other diseases. So which patient is suitable for home isolation? You could see there are uh, asymptomatic patients, mild, mild patients, you could, uh, you could send them for home isolation, but still uh, on uh, roughly around, uh, uh, around at the end of the week, maybe around uh, sixth or seventh day, they should be very cautious about certain signs. That if the patient have a cough on deep inspiration, if the patient has a cough on uh, breath holding, if the patient have a persistent fever more than seven days, or the patient is extremely tired with hypoxemia, definitely, definitely they should approach the healthcare system. Okay, what are the what are the treatment options available for COVID-19? Okay, that, that so we have come to the end. Like uh, so, we got um, uh, you know uh, uh, we got to know about uh, uh, like uh, uh, how it presented and uh, what are the various diagnostic modalities uh, we use to diagnose uh, COVID-19. But you know, treatment-wise, it's very simple. You know, for mild to for asymptomatic and mild cases, only supportive care is needed. There are a lot of drugs have been tried. I am just telling you right now that. Azithromycin, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine, ivermectin, none of these drugs have shown to be much efficacious in the clinical trials. So as far as, you know, my experience is concerned, this azithromycin initially, which was considered as a small, uh, considered as a very good drug along with HCQ uh, uh, from uh, small uh, 
studies from France. But you know, the, the, when you analyze the study, the, there is a huge flaw in the power of the study. There is a huge flaw in the methodology, how they perform. So we can't rely on this azithromycin hydroxychloroquine. Still, there are some centers which are using the azithromycin and hydroxychloroquine, but none of the international recommendations, none of the recommendations have uh, you know, clearly indicated that these um, drugs are efficacious against COVID-19. So what can we do for uh, this um, uh, mild symptoms? Those patients with mild symptoms, only symptomatic management. Uh, ask them to do uh, get, uh, get adequate hydration. You can give antipyretics to the patient heart, not settling out with antipyretics. You can try NSAIDs, particularly naproxen, 250 milligram BD that can be given if the fever is not settling out. Definitely, there is no harm in giving azithromycin, but you know, but just by giving simple azithromycin, don't think that you know uh, it 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 exerts a, a virostatic effect and all these things. So that's not the scenario. And hydroxychloroquine, you know, when you start hydroxychloroquine, there are there are certain compli cardiac complications that uh, chloroquine hydroxychloroquine you need to think of. And uh, patients in home, uh, you should not uh, try hydroxychloroquine. Uh, and we don't have um, supportive data for giving hydroxychloroquine for COVID-19. There are a lot of studies have been done for hydroxychloroquine, uh, whether it can be used for pre- and post expert prophylaxis. None of them proved to be effective uh, for uh, COVID-19. And as far as, you know, uh, present scenario is concerned for COVID-19 treatment for mild to moderate disease, there are uh, very few drugs which are highly effective. The number one drug, as per the international recommendation, as per the recommendation from the FDA and UEA, European Union Agency. So uh, there are two drugs which have been recently launched in India with the help of CIPLA. So basically, these are the monoclonal antibodies against the spike proteins. Uh, this is the research product from the you know Roche. These are the monoclonal antibodies against the spike protein that are uh, developed by genetic engineering technology. These, when they are given within a period of one week. They neutralize the virus and definitely around 70 to 80 percent they prevent the progression. This was widely accepted in trials and it was it was it was called a viral cocktail. It was called viral cocktail and it's been available in India uh, with a cost of around fifty thousand. So which prevents the progression of disease. That's one. And second drug, antiviral drug that have been widely accepted initially and later uh, uh, you know uh, went into the criticism is remdesivir. As far as my knowledge is concerned, remdesivir is a very good drug. Remdesivir is a potential antiviral drug. If you start in the right time for the right patient, definitely it prevents the progression of the disease, definitely it prevents the progression of hypoxemia, but you should not start very late. You should not start uh, in a patient who, who requires high amount of oxygen in HFNO or, uh, you know, the patient in CPAP or in the ventilator, you may not get a good response, but you should catch up that patient who are at a, uh, the period of seven to 10 days. Within that period, you should give this remdesivir. That's a, it's, it's a very good drug. So basically, remdesivir is the one of the only one drug which have been approved by FDA as an emergency use authorization for the treatment of COVID-19 pneumonia, even though remdesivir uh, doesn't prevent the complete progress of the illness. Uh, definitely remdesivir uh, will shorten the duration of illness. Definitely remdesivir will prevent the uh, progression of oxygen dependent um, scenario in patients with this uh, um, COVID-19 pneumonia. So what will you do when you see a patient with hypoxemia? So any patient with uh, SPO of less than 93 to 94 or the patient with respiratory of greater than 28 to 30 or the patient with dyspnea, administration of oxygen by 40% ventricular mass must be performed. After five to 10 minutes of reassessment, you should do a clinical instrumental picture, whether the patient has improved or not, then you can continue the treatment and uh, you can uh, re-evaluate after six hours. In case of failure, then you have to go for non-invasive uh, treatment if it's not contraindicated. So there are two options. Initially, when you try with uh, the oxygen mask, either with a non-rebreathing mask, uh, when, uh, when uh, the saturation is not uh, picking up uh, with the non-rebreathing mask, there are two other options. One is HFNO and uh, uh, NIV with the CPAP. So I feel that HFNO is very good for, uh, you know, the, the bridge measure for the patient who is progressing for uh, uh, ARDS. But what is the problem with HFNO? It consumes a lot of oxygen. You know, if you are giving around 50 liters per minute, can you imagine? Uh, in a scenario where, uh, where when there is a huge pandemic involving larger population, uh, you know, where the oxygen scarcity is there. So using HFNO is detrimental because, you know, it consumes a lot of oxygen. So that's that has, a, that has to be noted. But uh, based on the various recommendations, HFNO edges over CPAP. Because, you know, CPAP, you know, the patient voluntarily breaths and when you give pressure support or with the help of ventilator with the CPAP mask to the patient, you know, uh, there will be a variable tidal volume. You know, you can also induce a volumetric trauma, volume trauma to the lung. You know, there will be variable minute ventilation. There will be valuable, uh, you know, patient also takes effort. You know, he takes a breath and the pressure also, uh, we are giving pressure also inside. You know, it will injure the already injured lung. 
which can i can theoretically worsen the scenario but you know there is no other go but any patient who are having tachypnea uh, because hf you know can give a pressure support of max max up to, uh, 6 mm of peep so uh, after that you can't uh, you know give a uh, peep with uh, with the hf invo so any patient who are tachypneic who are using excerpts of axillary muscles of respiration who have high work of breathing we have no other go to go for uh, cpap with nav mask uh, and one of the uh, most important contraindication to hf invo is that any patient who are having a poor respiratory drive any patient who are already having a, a obstructive airway disease so these patient definitely will go for hypercapnia when you do when you give hf invo that uh, we need to uh, keep in mind and non invasive ventilation nav cpap play a major role in patient with respiratory failure and such a ways for nav and cpap there are different mask you can use you can use helmet mask you can use face mask uh, you can uh, with the help of expiratory valve and the settings will be like roughly around with the cpap you can start with 8 to 10 cm of water uh, you could avoid a, a higher fio2 better to keep at the fio2 at the sufficient level not more than uh, 50 to 60% initially and uh, uh pressure support when you are keeping nav start with a peep 5 cm of water checking the tolerance of the patient and bring to 8 to 10 and fio to around 60 pressure support around 8 to 10 so pressure support 8 to 10 with a peep of 5 will be a right choice initially and you can keep fio to around 60% so when the patient is not tolerating nav and uh, when the patient is uh, having uh, uh, severe uh, acidosis when the patient uh, develop acidosis even after that Uh, uh when the patient is moribund definitely we have no other choice to intubate the patient so while intubating actually uh, early intubation in ards is uh, definitely beneficial but this is not uh, true in case of uh, you know uh, covid 19 because there are some controversial data like you know the intubation uh, early uh, intubation late uh, you know some people are uh, for it and some people are against so basically any patient as per the criteria Uh, who are not um, tolerating NIV and who are not uh, maintaining their uh, ABG values as per the present standard, as per the standard, so they can uh, they, uh, they can be intubated. But intubation should be done by experienced operators. It should be a rapid sequence intubation with all the protective uh, measures like with FFP3 or N95 mask, goggles and full gown. All these things has to be uh, taken care of. a uh, pre oxygenation definitely has to be done because most of the patients will be uh, will be uh, will be having a prolonged hypoxemia if you are not pre oxygenating the patient within the time you know while putting the tube the patient will go for us so we should definitely pre oxygenate the patient 5 minutes uh, with cpap method before uh, putting the tube for this patient and what are the settings do you give for the uh, intubation the same thing what we follow for ards as a ards net protocol you should avoid giving higher volumes of uh, air inside we should avoid giving uh, higher volumes ever normally we keep around 8 to 10 ml of uh, per, per kg but uh, as per the ards net protocol uh, any ards will keep low tidal volume only will push less amount of air to avoid injury to the already injured lung 4 to 6 ml per kg has to be given and restrict the inspiratory pressure always inspiratory pressure should be less than 30 cm and the pressure pressure should be around 8 to 30 cm of water and peep must be as high as possible to maintain the driving pressure and usually uh, what what i used to keep around 10 to 14 because beyond 14 you know textbooks used to mention up to 18 20 also but it's very difficult to maintain with that so 10 to 14 you can just easily keep the peep uh, with adequate sedation protocols and uh, you know neuromuscular blocking agents and all we can do that uh, moreover uh, ventilator patient dis uh, dyssynchrony is one of the problem that we face in initially you can just very well manage with uh, uh, sedation protocols and we can very well manage initially for two days we can give uh, neuromuscular blocking agents and uh, but actually you know like uh, you should not uh, frequently use this uh, paralytics because if the patient is having severe ards uh, the pot of fio rather than 150 definitely paralytics actually uh, should be you know used with caution and of course in covid 19 prone ventilation has been recommended for the past one year and prone ventilation for more than 12 hours per day even with uh, tube also is recommended and use of conservative fluid management is also recommended as per the ards net, net protocol and one of the most important wonder drug uh, that's a uh, drug which a proven efficacy is corticosteroids so this we are discussing uh, for more than one year steroids is the wonder drug for treating any viral or atypical pneumonia or patient with ards even ards also early uh, steroids within a period of one week if you give uh, steroids there is a recovery will be there but uh, you know in covid 19 pneumonia steroids should be given only for particular group of patients those patient who have got a significant lung involvement with hypoxemia with spo of less than 94 or any patient who who are already on steroids 
for any other chronic disease, you can continue that steroids. For example, these patients already on rheumatoid arthritis or ILD or any patients CTD and all, they can continue the steroids. But unnecessarily, you should not start steroid in any patient with COVID-19 pneumonia. And moreover, there are some prescription I could see in day-to-day uh, -day practice. The steroids are being started from day one. That is another, uh, that is another bad decision that you, sh uh, you, you should never take. Uh, for starting steroid from day one, because when you start steroid from day one, what will happen? Like it will, you know, uh, it will worsen the viremia. It will prolong the phase of viremia, and uh, by the end, maybe after one week, if you stop steroids, there will be a high chance of strom. There is a high chance of cytokine. Uh, cytokine strom is there, so you should not uh, uh, give steroids in early phase of viremia. That's one other one other thing that you should note. And one of the most uh, promising trial that's recovery trial. So they demonstrated dexamethasone, specifically this steroid reduces the death by one third among the critical patients. Those patients who got a significant disease, who got a severe disease or very severe pneumonia, a simple low dose steroid, roughly around 6 mg, also is helpful in uh, protecting the patient from morbidity and mortality. So these are the different targets that you can uh, uh, concentrate, uh, concentrate uh, uh, how to attack this virus. You could see this is a SARS-CoV-2 with spike proteins. This with the spike protein gets fused to the ACE2 receptor. So what you can do, you can do, you can prevent the fusion of this SARS-CoV to the ACE2 receptor. How you can do that? You can give directly the antibodies. You can give monoclonal antibodies. That's what I told just now. Recently, they have launched, um, the, the Roche has launched in India. Uh, that is in, uh, that there are two, um, uh, there are two um, monoclonal antibodies uh, which have been launched in India. Uh, that is Casivir, map uh, and Indivimab. These are the two drugs, Casivirimab and Indivimab. These are the two drugs. These are the monoclonal antibodies against, against a spike protein. And these are brought out by genetic engineering technology. And these antibodies will neutralize the SARS-CoV-2 and prevents its entry into the cell. And this prevents the progression of clinically significant disease. Only one problem is that this is somewhat costly, around 52,000 as far as my knowledge is concerned. It's available in India. And when you give these antibodies, one important thing that you should note is that it's 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 preferable to advise these patients not to get vaccinated for at least 90 days from that uh, from the timing of therapy. And the second fusion receptor for this one, uh, other than the ACE2 is TMPRSS2 receptor. This TMPRSS2 receptor also is considered as a core receptor for this SARS-CoV-2 for attachment to the host receptor. This TMPRSS2 is inhibited by the, these two drugs, that is uh, camostat, mesylate, and Nafomostat. I don't know whether this drug is available or not, but there is one cheap drug which is available, which acts on this TMPRS2 receptor, which can block the entry of virus into the cell. They are given for some patients and it has been, uh, uh, there, there are a lot of trials to study uh, the efficacy of this drug, uh, whether this can be given prophylactically practically for those patients who got exposed to SARS-CoV-2. So basically, uh, you know, this uh, the drug called bromexin. <laughs> Bromoxin is not a new drug, it's another mucolytic drug which have been used uh, for many years. So 8 mg, 4 times a day, you know, for, for, for some day, for almost like 7 to 10 days, you know, it acts on the TMPRS2 receptor, it blocks the entry of virus into the cell. And next target is, you know, once the virus gets entry into the cell, it fused with the host membrane. This is, this is a process called endocytosis. This fusion is prevented by chloro, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. This, uh, this was studied worldwide and, you know, even though it prevents the fusion, but, you know, efficacy wise, it's not, uh, you know, very good for moderate to severe pneumonia, maybe for mild illness and asymptomatic uh, patients. There are some sporadic studies which supported the use of chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. And the most important, uh, uh, the pathway that is RNA dependent RNA polymerase pathway, which is stuck out by the antiviral drugs like remdesivir and fibrovir. This remdesivir and fibrovir will act on the viral replication and it will act in here. So there are five targets. You could see that you could attach, you know, you can use a conventional plasma, you can use monoclonal antibodies to prevent the, the virus fusion into the cell surface, or you can use this uh, camostate mesylate or bromoxin to block this TM periods to uh, att attachment. We can prevent the fusion with the help of chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine. We can prevent the proteolysis with the help of lopinavir-retinavir. I, I don't think lopinavir-retinavir have been very studied in India. It has been used in, uh, in, in abroad in Asian countries for COVID-19, but the studies are not, uh, you know, uh, very helpful and beneficial for the patient with COVID-19. Remdesivir is very well used and fiber is very well used, which acts in the uh, uh, viral replication, that is um, uh, 3G RNA replication. So as I already described, no uh, antiviral drugs have been proven. So whatever antiviral drug you give, 
so everything has to be given the matter of sound to 10 days of illness so basically the antiviral drugs works very well in the initial phase remdesivir as i already described it's one of the very good drug if you give an early phase alpha interferon there are some uh, companies come up with uh, pegylated alpha interferon as you know that interferon is nothing but uh, uh, substances with the 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 the, the, the uh, cytokines that are released in response to the viral infected host cells this interferon has an excellent antiviral property and other anti inflammatory properties so this interferon is pegylated and has given either in the form of subcutaneous injection or in the form of uh, inhalation therapy it is somewhat beneficial in mild to moderate cases you should never try this this alpha interferon in those patients who, who got a severe lung involvement who got a hypoxemia definitely it won't be helpful other antiviral drug like oseltamivir has been used for covid 19 patients but you know that is also not uh, so much helpful and fibrovir has demonstrated certain efficacy of past covid 2 particularly the patients with a mild to moderate illness but even though there are there are lot of scientific flaws in the usage of fiber but definitely theoretically it is somewhat beneficial uh, in a, when you use uh, this drug in the early phase of illness chloroquine there are different dosing strategies 500 mg every 2 12 hours hydroxychloroquine 200 mg every 2 hours proposed as immunomodulatory therapy but none of them proved efficacious against this covid 19 hydroxychloroquine was initially uh, thought that uh, it is associated with viral load reduction and until viral disappearance all these things of initially they have tried but this has been uh, not uh, proven right now and uh, you know zero therapy the, you know this the covid identification of high incidence of venous thromboembolism and anticoagulant therapy is associated with a reduced icu mortality so definitely thromboplaxis has to be given but there is a nick here actually uh, anticoagulation should be preferred for those patients who are hospitalized those patients are really sick and those patients who are moderately ill other patients who are having a risk factors are developing thrombosis you should always do a scoring systems as you do for other diseases you should do a scoring system how far this patient is at, at risk of developing any thrombosis whether it is a venous uh, uh, deep vein thrombosis or whether pulmonary embolism lot of scoring systems are there so after that only you should start not uh, this you know anticoagulant should not be generally used for opd based uh, 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 patients and all it should be definitely given for hospitalized patients and regarding vaccines there are different vaccine in india we have uh, uh, now three vaccines covaxin covishield and uh, sputnik v and according uh, to the uh, uh, recent reports sputnik v sputnik v is uh, sounds good uh, you know efficacy wise uh, around 91.6% efficacy wise uh, when compared to the this two uh, previous vaccine that's covaxin covishield but whatsoever the efficacy is the not much of difference and sputnik v you know uh, it is a viral vector based uh, um, viral vector based uh, vaccine uh, they use adenovirus as a vector to promote this uh, 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 the spike protein into the uh, into the host and uh, there are two vectors that's adenovirus 26 and 5 there are two different variants uh, they are uh, because the uh, the second dose is different that's what you know other than the covaxin and uh, you know covishield here there is there's a nick in the second dose you know the vector that is carrying the uh, s protein is different i think it is it's definitely it's good whereas uh, this uh, this covaxin uh, the phase 3 trial uh, shown the efficacy around 78% but official data has yet to be published and uh, uh, definitely there are some reports of uh, uh, thrombotic events with covishield uh, of course but it is very very rare only around 210 uh, co- uh, thrombotic events have been reported officially Uh, in their website and uh, definitely we need to uh, see lots on this uh, vaccines and there are uh, supportive uh, data that some of the mutants have been covered with this uh, vaccines also so you could see the uh, oxford uh, university astrazeneca vaccine moderna vaccine pfizer vaccine and this gamelia institute that sputnik vaccine what we are just uh, uh, talking right now is the efficacy of around 92% uh, whereas pfizer bio and tech vaccine around 95% moderna vaccine on 95% the oxford vaccine what is commonly being used now covid shield is around 62 to 90% so these are the different pharmacotherapies have been uh, are reported uh, let's discuss this aims protocol recent protocol then uh, we will bind up so any patient who got a mild disease the home isolation contact droplet uh, decent uh, precaution has to be done uh, you should always advise the patient when there is difficulty in breathing when there is a high grade of fever and severe cough if it lost more than 5 days that's what i told any patient who have a prolonged or persistent fever or any patient who got a severe cough after 5 days definitely they need to address uh, you know that they, they need to uh, go to the nearest healthcare system uh, a low threshold to to be kept for those patients with high risk features a peripheral oxygen saturation by applying spo2 probe to the finger should be monitored 
and make sure that the finger should not be cold uh, before putting the probe. And these are the drugs have been advised as per the AIMS protocol, tablet ivermectin, 200 microgram per kilogram uh, per uh, once a day. That is 12 mg what we are, we are using. Three to, uh, three to five days can be considered. But actually, the WHO and other uh, you know, uh, important organizations are totally against using this ivermectin. Uh, they, are just at, uh, they are just in a, um, in, a, in a position statement that this is a drug that is used for animals. And there are not much of supportive studies uh, for humans. And uh, they issued a warning also for using ivermectin. But we are commonly following uh, ivermectin nowadays in India, in many centers. And inhaled butosinate, inhaled steroids almost like 800 microgram twice daily with the patient is having a first and cough. Definitely there is no role of steroids in the initial phase. Definitely there is no role of systemic steroids in a mild disease. In case of moderate disease, well, saturated target saturation of 90 to 96%. So any patient who got a hypoxemia, definitely there is a role of, uh, you know, steroid. You should admit the patient, ask for awake warning and uh, steroid dose, a methyl point is 0.5 to 1 mg um, or uh, equivalent dose of dexamethasone can be given. And all the patients with moderate to severe pneumonia, a prophylactic dose of uh, unfractionate apparent or low mark apparent has to be given. And definitely clinical monitoring has to be done. Every third day, you need to do some tests, CRP, DDMR, CBC, uh, LFT, RFT, and all these things has to be done. And IL-6, only those patients who are got a sudden deterioration, when you are planning for any tocilizumab and all these things, you can just go for a uh, IL-6 uh, uh, monitoring. And same thing, whatever I've discussed, those patients who got a hypoxia, hypoxemia, we could try with all the, uh, you know, face mask, then uh, you should try with uh, NRBM mask, then you could try with uh, HFNC and NIV and finally intubation. The same thing, like uh, methylprednisolone, so you could see the difference in dose. Those patients are critically ill, you should uh, slightly, uh, you know, increase the dose of methylprednisolone, dexamethasone, anticoagulation also, uh, better to give a therapeutic dose and uh, avoid uh, for sepsis and, uh, you know, you need to maintain circulation also, that also has to be taken care and remdesivir and tocilizumab. Tocilizumab, a little bit discussion, tocilizumab is not freely available now and uh, for the past one and a half months, it's very difficult to get. Uh, tocilizumab can be given in those patients who got a very high interleukin-6, sudden deterioration of symptoms, very high CRP, more than 75, uh, or uh, any patient who got deteriorating even after giving steroids. So definitely tocilizumab, single or two shots can be given. And uh, some other studies like recovery and uh, trials have uh, supported the use of tocilizumab in selected group of patients. And convalescent plasma, initially they were using uh, in and out, but nowadays uh, there's a big no for convalescent plasma because uh, the trials and studies are not supporting the use of convalescent plasma. This is a new drug, uh, this molprenavir, and maybe it may be uh, coming in future. And uh, the DRDO, uh, DCGA has approved a drug, one more drug called 2DG uh, for the emergency use authorization that can be uh, instituted for those patients who are hospitalized. Uh, particularly, the phase three trials suggest the faster recovery in hospitalized patients and definitely oxygen dependence is also very low when compared to other things. So, 2DG has been used in the radiotherapy department for many years and is considered very safe. It stops the viral replication when you give an early viremia phase. So that's all from my end. If anything to be discussed, I'm ready to take. Thank you. Thank you, Anand. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yuvrajan, sir. I think uh, yeah. your talk really was uh, very exhaustive right from start to the end. I think understanding COVID, you made your talk made it so simple that I think uh, you covered every aspect of it, right from diagnosis, management, which options, which category of patients and what are the you know, specific indications and what subset of patient should be used. I think in this amidst critical times of COVID, I believe that there is uh, really a very, you know, uh, shift, a paradigm shift in our practice. And I think your session was so very useful and sort of an eye-opener session, I would say that which simplified the topic and that make it look so simple. So with this, I request all our viewers to post their questions in the chat box. Uh, if you have uh, any uh, questions, uh, you can ask uh, to our uh, honorable speaker and we can have a wonderful, fruitful discussion on the uh, topic. Uh, I think, sir, a couple of questions. Yeah, have... yeah I'll, I, I've, I've seen on question. So why now withdrawn remdesivir in treating COVID-19? Shall we use this to treat an early, mild to moderate case? That's a good question because last wave actually um, people are pushing this remdesivir and you know there are, there are a lot of data which are supporting. So the, there are uh, there are many um, case reports and case series 
supporting the use of remdesivir because remdesivir is a very good drug when you choose correctly a patient, like uh, maybe uh, in the early phase of deterioration. So when there's a dip in saturation, immediately if you start along with the steroids, definitely you should do a magic for the patients. But you can't depend on this remdesivir when you uh, give remdesivir for the second or third week because people are coming with hypoxemia on day 12 or day 14. Uh, at, that, at that time, you know, you got a full damage in the lung. You got an early ARDS. So what is the point in giving antiviral drug? Okay, anti, this viral phase is, you know, the initial uh, seven to eight days. So it depends upon the, you know, the varimia depends upon, you know, the, uh, the host uh, people like the, the, any patient who are diabetic or on immunosuppressives. So they have a prolonged phase of viremia. Okay, so when you give an antiviral drug for second week, we can't be very sure. As he has asked one right question, shall we use this to treat early mild to moderate case? Definitely, you know, actually the remdesivir, uh, you know, there is a scarcity of remdesivir initially. That's why emergency use authorization, in, even in, uh, uh, even in uh, FD also, they have clearly mentioned that remdesivir can be given for all the patients who are diagnosed with COVID-19 pneumonia. First preference has to be given for patients with hypoxemia. Any patient who got hypoxemia with SPO2 of 94, who got a diagnosis of COVID-19 pneumonia, you go ahead and uh, go ahead and giving remdesivir. Or other patients who got a severe, uh, who got a high risk of developing severe disease. That's what I told. Elderly patients, patients on steroids, patients on chemotherapeutic agents, patients are already uh, known um, uh, serious illness, maybe a uh, uh, known uh, uh, neoplastic disease and all, or with chemotherapeutic agents. Definitely, you can just give this rem. There is no harm in giving remdesivir. The risk of giving, uh, uh, the risk of getting complications in is somewhat less, as far as my, uh, you know, experience is concerned. Right, sir. I think uh, thank you so much for uh, giving your comments, sir. Uh, actually, there are a couple of questions that I've received yeah, in ask. my chat box, sir. Yeah, please. Uh, so, sir, I think you mentioned about the diagnosis. I think in depth you had a you know a slide discussing about the diagnosis. Uh, yeah. But just one question, even in fact, I had the same question in my mind, I think, uh, you know, a couple of weeks back when one of the senior doctor raised the query with respect to a CT test, uh, yeah. which is equivalent to, you know, multiple x-rays and all. So yeah. what is your take on it that when should we refer patient to, uh, you know, CT center for doing a, a, a you know, diagnosis of clear cut diagnosis of uh, a COVID uh, with respect to CT? So when to refer, sir? Yeah. So basic problem with the COVID-19 is it's, it's, it's highly unpredictable disease. Okay. So we have to predict, you know, each day what is going to happen to the patient. Then only we can prevent the morbidity and mortality. There is no point in pushing up the drugs, toclizumab. There is no point in pushing up all immunosuppressive drugs in the second week. You catch the person early. You catch the patient on the wall, cat on the wall like situations. Okay. It's, it's our responsibility to do that. We should get a proper history from the patient. We should get a history that when was the first day of illness? What were their symptoms? So if they could, they could tell the first day of illness, so each day I could assess that where the virus is there. Okay, maybe initial three days, they have a more of upper spectrum symptoms. They will have more of fever, more of myalgia and tiredness and dizziness. So these are the common symptoms usually uh, we saw in this, uh, uh, in this uh, second wave of pandemic. And, you know, from day five to day eight is very crucial. So exactly if you want to tell from day six to eight, this is my experience. So that's why most of the times I'll ask them to do, do a CT scan at the end of the one week, maybe around sixth day or seventh day only. Because, you know, if you do a CT on day one or day two, you may get a normal scan. These people won't monitor. Okay. Maybe like they will get some two days or three days of fever. They put antipyretics and they'll go, they'll roam off. And that's, that's dangerous. Just because that fever has gone, so you should not, uh, you know, uh, take it very lightly. Because, you know, the end of the week, that is the 6th or 7th day is very crucial. So, if 6th or 7th day, if you are doing a CT scan, that, but that is also not advice for all the patients. I don't advise CT scan for all the patients. Only for those patients who got the clinical signs of progression. Maybe those patients got a persistent high fever. Because most of the times, we see 3 to 4 days fever. After that, fever settles off. Usually, I'm telling but some patients have a high fever morning, afternoon, night that settles out only with paracetamol. So that group of patients and those patients who are poorly controlled diabetes mellitus, very high HbA1c levels. So these patients have a prolonged viremia. And we expect that viral proliferation will be, where, you know, uh, will be exhaustive in this group of patients. We expect a more amount of damage in these patients. So that group of patients and those patients who got a cough, 
actually cough is another bad sign that's what i told you now because cough may be there in early phase as a part of upper respiratory tract involvement maybe if by sore throat or post nasal drip or a patient is not having cough suddenly developing cough on fifth day or sixth day that's one of the bad sign so that's why aims protocol they have mentioned this inhaled corticosteroids only for that early phase but the inhaled corticosteroids may not be helpful it can help you to pick up that but after that cough phase you know within 2 3 days the patient will have a dip in saturation that phase we need to pick up because that dip in saturation within a matter of 48 hours if we start steroids low dose steroids definitely we can save any patient if you leave that definitely it'll go for a lung damage if you go for a pustular hypoxemia definitely the patient will suffer for a long duration thank you uh, uh, thank you so much for i think answering this uh, question uh, i think there is one question sir uh, pertaining to diagnostics uh, actually so can uh, sars cov2 variants be reliably detected by the available diagnostic assays yes actually see with the rt pcr what we are uh, uh, seeing is a uh, is you know uh, we are seeing the 2 2 3 uh, you know foci in the 2 3 foci even though a mutation is there the virus won't get mutated as a whole in parts only i told you that s protein only is just changed okay so definitely with the available rt pcr we can pick up almost most of the new strains also but 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 even in mutations there are some strains we can't be picked up so it depends upon uh, that is one part that is actually less common when compared to the faulty test faulty timing of test and all these things Oh, if you get a negative report if you get a negative report instead of thinking that we got, uh, we are we are having mutant strains think that uh, we have done a test at the wrong time we have uh, done a test in the wrong method and all these things right sir right sir i think uh, very well said sir your point is really very uh, i think sir there's one more interesting question uh, is that i think uh, even if uh, a person is or patient is now getting a fever immediately you would start suspecting it could be covid so what is your take is there a way to distinguish covid 19 clinically from other respiratory illness particularly influenza sir? okay for uh, for any fever in this covid 19 pandemic should be considered as a covid 19 only until proven otherwise because you know uh, this is this, this is another fault that all the people are doing uh, initially they think that it is because of some other fever they do a viral test you know they think it's a typhoid okay the viral test is actually age old test it may be passed in any viral fevers also so we should not rely on that actually and in this covid 19 pandemic uh, our main aim is to pick up the disease early so that we can prevent the morbidity and mortality the main thing so covid is not a very difficult disease to treat okay if you just give the patient uh, you know uh, in the right time you can save any any number of patients without any problem so basically that is the thing so any patient with a fever in this pandemic consider covid as a you know first uh, differential diagnosis and you could you should do a testing on day 2 or day 3 that's my advice but you know there are some other fevers also you should consider but you prefer to do this test then you can go ahead with other test and the pattern also fever with with fever pattern also we can't clearly predict there are some patients who are just coming with a low grade fever maybe around 99 100 there are some patient who are coming with fever chills and rigors but most of the patient come with low grade fever which settles with paracetamol but one sign very important sign is that you will get a typical myalgia very severe body pain will be there you can't explain that in words like only those patient who got affected can clearly tell you they can't even lift the uh, lift their uh, upper limbs their uh, you know neck pain and typical excruciating back pain uh, that can give some clue that uh, we are facing covid 19 right sir uh so there's uh, one more question uh, pertaining uh, to uh, another complications i think now there is a new term altogether we call it as a long covid sir so uh, your take on it sir yes i accept that because there are some two patients uh, i got a opinion uh, last week that uh, they got fever in after two months also you know they got fever and, and when i searched the literature uh, in us and uk there are some patients who are having you know persistent spikes of fever you know short spikes uh, they are not having a persistent fever beyond 24 hours uh, one small spike will be there that sets out the paracetamol and, uh, and after rest so this is there even up, reported up to 4 months 6 months also 
okay nobody knows what is the exact reason some people are telling is because of dead variants some people is uh, telling this altered uh, host uh, uh, immunological response and all these things uh, there are a lot of theories they are focusing that is one thing and second thing fatigue fatigue have been reported uh, even after recovery of covid almost like uh, even those patient who got a significant disease they have fatigue they have fatigue so fatigue is there up to 45 days 45 days and those uh, those patient got a lung involvement or uh, those patient who got a severe pneumonia they have a prolonged hypoxemia also they have a cough hacking cough and prolonged hypoxemia are the two common presentations and uh, uh, you know day by day the uh, when they give a proper care and uh, when they have a good follow up uh, they could achieve uh, you know near normal lung function after 2 to 3 months right sir right sir uh, sir i think uh, pertaining to this again you uh, you know mentioned very well about the long covid how about managing the post covid cough uh, sir how do would you what would be your approaching strategy sir yeah see actually post covid cough you have to see whether this cough is because of uh, you know there, there are lot of uh, you know uh, path, uh, pathogenic mechanisms why the cough develops in post covid patients uh, actually covid uh, uh, covid initially involves the rna in pneumonia pattern uh, it it involves a periphery of lung it involves a peribronchial region so because of that there will be peribronchial fibrosis and you will have a hacking cough whenever you do uh, any exertion whenever you do any straining exercises and all these things you will have a continuous bouts of cough so what you have to do those patient who got a significant hypoxemia and those patient who got a significant amount of interstitial fibrosis i am not telling for all the patients those patient who got a significant cough and significant dip in saturation after exertion maybe we can do 6 minute walk test and you can see that so if you have, they have a interstitial fibrosis along with this we can give a short course of anti fibrotics even though there is no recommended international guidelines or recommendations for using anti fibrotics just because that these people will rob, um, uh, rampantly use this anti fibrotics if you tell so that's why there is no guidelines which is recommending anti fibrotics for post covid fibrosis so i am using for selected patients those patients who have a persistent cough or those patient who have a cough with hypoxemia on exertion after discharge those patient who got a significant amount of interstitial fibrosis by ct scan i will give a, usually a course of anti fibrotics after all the clinical examination so that is actually you know which, which will which will improve the lung healing which will reduce the cough scores and all and enhances the uh, you know lung function recovery uh, i think sir uh, we are running short of time but the list of questions is really really big sir i think this yes. shows the love for you and uh, yes. you know the kind of uh, answers that you are giving but i think uh, sir just would like to take a few couple of questions i think they are mostly repetitive questions so i'll take yeah. that uh, i think there is one question with respect to i think you have already mentioned but the doctor is insisting on asking for role of ivermectin in COVID. okay <laughs> see actually ivermectin uh, even i am also using i am not denying that for so, even for mild cases i am using uh, basically you know for any uh, any drug to be approved from by international agency you should have a human studies and that studies should be uh, properly done with without any methodological flaws but as far as all the reports and studies i uh, have searched for ivermectin most of the studies are based on animal models and most of the studies on humans have uh, you know doesn't have a proper comparative data so that's why uh, it's very hard to you know tell that ivermectin you should use for all the patients but definitely ivermectin works very well 12 mg per, uh, once daily for 3 to 5 days can be given that's why aims also accepted that and included in the guidelines even though who and other people are continuously criticizing the use of ivermectin which is another parasitic drug anti parasitic drug we don't know the, about the you know safety data in human beings but still ivermectin for uh, parasitic infections we are using uh, the dose what we are using is also not uh, you know very alarming we can use there is no harm in it so only thing is that ivermectin should not be given for uh, pregnancy because it's somewhat teratogenic it can be given for lactating mothers because uh, i have searched the literature even in lactating mothers also the amount of uh, ivermectin secreted in the breast milk is far far negligible to reach the babies so you can use for lactating mothers but never ever use ivermectin for pregnant uh, mothers and uh, and second thing uh, like ivermectin should not be used for uh, children uh, uh, less over less than 15 kg so you can use ivermectin even for children more than 15 kg 
thank you, sir. I think for addressing this question, I think just I would quickly take just one last question. Uh, it was regarding with respect to uh, corticosteroids. I think uh, there is an altogether, I think there is a fuss and there is red flags, both in and out, considering the fact that even there is an increased uh, cases of mucormycosis right now. So, yeah, yeah. you know, what is your take on it? I mean, corticosteroids usage, which, when, dose, because I think uh, overall, if we look at even at the asthma patient or a COPD patient who needs uh, glucocorticoids, so should those patients also, you know, should continue with usage of uh, glucocorticoids or can in those patients, systemic glucocorticoids should be given, yes or no, sir, your take on it, sir. So basically, steroids play a very uh, major role. As far as, you know, all the drugs are concerned, I have listed a lot of drugs. You know, remdesivir, all the monoclonal antibodies, steroids, anticoagulants. Actually, life-saving drug is steroid. That comes number one. Okay. Even though we are, we are discussing, you know, uh, uh, all the ill effects of steroid, steroids are life-saving. Without steroid, no allopathy, no medicine. I'm telling you, this is a wonder drug. But, you know, it's like a knife. Only those people who know how to cut they should use it. Otherwise, you should not use it. That's the problem with steroid. Basically, when you tell steroid is a wonder drug, people are, you know, very, you know, fond of using steroid from day one. That should not happen. Le? Because on day one, the, you have aremia. If you give steroid, what will happen? There will be a host immune response will be suppressed. Uh, so, you are giving way for the virus to proliferate. So, never yeah. ever give steroid for any patient with the initial base of viremia. So, maybe at the, at the end of one week, Definitely viral load might have been reduced at the end of one week, I'm telling. So when you when you when there is a reduced viral load and when there is a clear indication of starting steroid, I already told you, clear indication is significant lung involvement in the form of hypoxemia, tachypnea. Hypoxemia with SVO of less than 94. So 94 is a cutoff, uh, they have told in guidelines. But any deep in saturation, I'll start. Actually, that the statement has to be changed. Actually, you know, many people are sitting uh, idly or lying down idly or lying in prone position and checking the SPO2 and just thinking that they are good. It's not like that. So the first test that what you do is a exertion SPO2. Ask the patient to exert. Ask the patient to walk for six minutes. If the patient can't able to walk for six minutes, ask the patient to walk for at least two minutes. After two minutes, after giving exercise, just assess the lung response. Assess the oxygenation. If there is a dip, in, a dip or there's a fall, just light fall also. If the patient, for example, 98, if there's a fall of 95 also, don't wait for 94. <laughs> because who gave this cutoff? Okay. So it's based on the data. So it's basically, it depends upon the different people. So there is a dip in saturation, more hacking cough, prolonged symptoms. When you are at the end of the week, definitely go with steroid. At the back of, at the backup of inflammatory markers, inflammatory markers, higher CRP, Serial higher CRP because many people used to do CRP in a single value and see because on day one they do CRP, they think that oh, CRP is 25, CRP is 30, CRP is 40. You should not see the day one because you are in early viremia phase. Definitely, CRP will be more. So, if you have a CRP at the end of one week, so if you have a data, serially there is elevating CRP. For example, day one it is 20, day, uh, day four it is around uh, 40, day seven it is around 75. Definitely, you should start steroid for this patient. So, serial assessment of inflammatory markers, not a single assessment, serial assessment of patient, all these things. And regarding the uh, uh, type of steroid and regarding the dose of steroid, what you use, actually, you know, uh, as a pulmonologist, uh, we are fond of uh, some steroid which, which achieves very good concentration in the lung. Uh, this is an age-old concept. Among all the steroids, we, what we want is that we want a glucocorticoid action steroid because steroid have glucocorticoid mineral cortical action. Glucocorticoid is responsible for anti-inflammatory action. We want anti-inflammatory action. There are only two, three potent steroids that are available in the market which is having higher glucocorticoid action, which are negligible. One is methylprednisone, other one is uh, uh, this uh, dexamethasone, and third one is deflesacort. Deflesacort. Okay, so these two drugs have a very high uh, glucocorticoid action. We can either choose uh, uh, methylprednisone or uh, dexamethasone. But, you know, what I feel is that uh, even though the trials are telling a uh, recovery trial, they have used dexamethasone and all, a lot of trials. But uh, what I feel is that most of the lung diseases, we are fond of using methylprednisone. Just for the simple reason, methylprednisone achieves very high concentration in the lung. It is a steroid for the lung. It is the steroid for the lung. And moreover, you could see the time of action, half-life. When you see the dexamethasone, it has a wide half-life. It can act up to 70 hours also if you give single dose. 
so it has a highly unpredictable action so when you give steroid for 5 days also there is high chance that you can suppress the your hypothalamus pituitary axis suppression any age old patient any patient who are bedridden if you give steroid you may have a shutdown of uh, your uh, cortical system the patient may you may you may provoke a addison's disease also that's why for many days i have a concept that i never used examenso for this simple reason because it's erratic uh, you know pharmacokinetic profile and a long duration of action okay that's why even for pulse dose even for any immunosuppressive dose for anti inflammatory dose most of the studies they used methylprednisolone except for this covid 19 just because the lecker rate trial they used dexamethasone they used but as far as uh, my knowledge is concerned both are same both are equal there is no difference with the side effect profile only thing is that side effect profile the dexamethasone have a long duration of action that you need to consider regarding the dose you, you better to use a low dose so if you are using a meth uh, uh, dexamethasone it is around uh, 8 mg of 6 mg salt based or 6 mg we can give as a low dose uh, equivalent to dexamethasone methylprednisolone 16 mg two tablets or 32 mg uh, will be the right choice equivalent dose so and other things like you can use hydrocortisone also for that but hydrocortisone i won't prefer because i say already told you hydrocortisone even though guidelines they are given hydrocortisone this cortisone have a glucocort mineralocorticoid action is cortisone act as a fluid retention property as per the theoretical knowledge okay hydrocortisone we should prefer only in icu just for a patient with septic shock who are not maintaining their uh, you know bp other things these two drugs very good dexa 6 and methylprednisolone 32 mg once daily uh i think uh, fantastic you know sort of discussion we had today i think uh, there are many questions in fact sir but i do uh, respect the time of your sir Uh, i think in this uh, middle of uh, crucial situation sir you gave your crucial one and a half hours in fact i should be really thankful to you sir for giving this so much of in depth knowledge on the topic in fact there are many things you have cleared fundamentally so clear i think it's clear in the minds of i believe all the doctors and it's definitely going to help each and every one of us in our clinical practice in our day to day practice in managing covid Uh, you know across uh, all the uh, you know uh, severity of the cases i think once again would like to thank you sir for sparing your valuable time with us and sharing your deepest insights and on behalf of uh, jv chemicals and pharmaceuticals uh, limited would like to you know thank for uh, you know actually uh, and saluting you sir in fact for uh, you know giving you so much time for your patients and helping us in the entire society Uh, pertaining and managing such a crucial phase managing all the uh, patients and helping them and serving the society we salute you all th uh, thoroughly for uh, your wonderful and your hard work sir i think just would like to take your 2 minutes sir if you uh, give me allow me 2 uh, minutes time of yours just would like to uh, you know showcase some of our brands that we have just recently introduced in our uh, division with your due permission sir Uh, so sir uh, we have uh, just uh, in a uh, last uh, couple of weeks itself we have uh, uh, brought in a wonderful new division all together which has now been called as nova in jv chemicals and pharmaceuticals limited as a part of respi oral segment as of now at a very initial stage of course i do understand so we have got certain brands like uh, nilist and nilist m which includes belastine and belastine with montelukast uh, as an oral anti histamine segment and uh, particularly uh, when it comes to uh, uh, managing hyper mucor secretory phase uh, we have got anacetyl cysteine in the form of effervescent tablet which is sugar free uh, orange flavor under the brand name of visco joy and we have also got visco joy ab which is in combination with acibrofilin it's again in the form of tablet we have also got one very important product since we are pioneered in lozenges manufacturing and jb chemicals is well known for its manufacturing and exporting lozenges internationally across 40 plus global regulated markets and for the very first time in india jb chemicals have introduced nicotine replacement therapy in the form of lozenges uh, to manage the withdrawal symptoms for the smokers who wish to quit uh, tobacco uh, and uh, cigarette smoking so the brand name is uh, no smoke so we have got in in the form of lozenges 2 mg and 4 mg and like uh, very well sir uh, mentioned about methyl prednisolone so we have got dispred as the brand name we, uh, with two uh, skus 4 mg and 8 mg and also as a part of uh, covid uh, manage regimen we have got fevipiravir tablet under the brand name of fevipil 
400 mg and 800 mg tablets and also for managing influenza we have got uh, altavir that is uh, oseltamivir uh, 75 mg uh, capsule and very soon we are going to uh, come up with a even a management of ild portfolio i think sir really in depth explained about long covid and what would be the post covid complications so i think the earthquake has already you know happened but i think post covid tsunami uh, would be there expected uh, and many doctors are really expecting that there, the post covid syndrome would be lasting long in many patients so i think we are bringing in the entire portfolio of uh, managing ild so very soon we are going to launch nindetenib and perfenidone and followed by ph care our entire uh, portfolio we would be uh, bringing in so uh, that's it from our side uh, if there are any questions from any other doctors i think i would request them to unmute yourself you can ask the questions or any comments any other comments uh, please uh, i think i would uh, welcome anyone to you know it's an open fair forum for uh, discussion uh, so it's i think uh, would like to finally give my vote of thanks to all the participants as well for sparing their valuable time and making this event a very very uh, successful event so thank you so much all of you stay safe take care have a wonderful day and thank you so much over to you rangarajan sir if there is uh, you know anything final vote of thanks from your end sir thank you I'll open the session for uh... Five minutes, uh, sir. Whether uh, any questions you can answer, sir. Any doctors they want to ask? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. So otherwise we can. Sir, any other doctors like to uh, ask any questions, sir? I think actually majority of the questions they given in the chat box, so we almost covered. Okay, sir. Uh, sir, first of all, uh, thank you very much, doctor, uh, for giving a wonderful time and uh, this busy busy schedule. So you given a wonderful talk to uh, all of our audience doctors, and thank you very much, sir. And we covered almost the entire Tamil Nadu doctors and many doctors across the Tamil Nadu participated in this event. So few of the Kerala doctors also participating in this event. Uh, so I like to thank uh, each and every doctor and uh, for uh, having uh, such a wonderful audience. and thank you very much uh, doctor for giving wonderful speech again and we will be doing much more academic programs with you sir and uh, thank you very much sure sure thank, thank you. you sir thank you so much thank you sir thank you sir thank you sir so thank you very much for every doctor uh, we will be ending the session within few minutes sir thank you Doctor J, we can uh, end the event. Doctor J? Yeah, sure. Thank yeah, you yeah. so much. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'll share the recording with the uh, uh, yeah. uh, Lakshmi sir, uh, and uh, user. Yeah. I'll uh, Google link now, sir. Google link only will send it to you. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your valuable help, sir. Doctor J, sir. Thank you.